Welcome to the Startup Grind. So thank you so much, Philip, for joining us tonight. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh, really great, and apparently you have a lot of friends here tonight as well. I uh, already have a lot of friends, and <laughs> I hope to make more. Awesome. We usually like to start off with understanding a little bit where you come from, as in where were you born, that far back. As, uh, still, uh, Canton of Zurich would have supported that, so it wasn't, it wasn't too far from here. I was okay. actually born and raised in, in a small town uh, in the mountainy area of Canton Zurich. Okay. Um, um, from where you, you usually go to winter tour, so we, mm. we haven't been uh, going to Zurich when, when I was growing up. Um, went went uh, to high school in winter tour, yeah. uh, and from there on it was, it was ETH for, mm. for a lot of time for me. And growing up in Winterthur, how was that uh, as, as a, um, I guess, how many people are, are familiar with the city of Winterthur? How does it compare to, to Zurich? Ooh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Is that too sensitive a question? <laughs> I don't know. Who's, who's actually from Winterthur? Yeah? No one. So, so oh, <laughs> one, one person. <laughs> so we have to be careful. Um, look, it's it's a very nice city. It's a smaller city. It's very green. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of trees there, um, and, and it's very close to Zurich, which is a big advantage as well. Um, it certainly, did have its its greatest time some 100, maybe 150 years ago, with mm -hmm. a lot of heavy industry going on with Sulzer and Rieto. Um, now it's it's more of a, a commuter town. Okay. Uh, if, if you live in winter tour, a lot of people. They actually work in Zurich, mm. so if, if you're either, it doesn't matter what you do, a train or, or a car, it, it will take you a lot of time to, to get to work because there is just too many people trying to get from one Back city to the other. Yeah. yeah. And what were your ambitions as a child? What were you, what were you thinking when you were growing up? Did, did you imagine yourself as the owner of a company or as a fireman or as a farmer or? Uh, ooh. <laughs> don't, don't actually recall. Um, honestly, uh, don't recall. Uh, remember, there was a time when I when I believed I, I need to become an airliner pilot, but that was like a very <laughs> short phase. Um, and after that, I was always into into computers. Right. Like from a very young age, we we had the first gen of Max at home, mm. and that thing just captured my. Everything, my attention, my inspiration. I, I was just spending so much time with that thing, trying to figure out how does it work, what can I do with it, and that was at how old was I back then? Twelve, mm -hmm. I guess so. Okay. Yeah. And did you start doing anything no, business related, or was was um, just well that came at a later stage when when I was at high school, um, which was in in winter tour. Uh, I was very lucky that my high school was was really leading. Uh, it, they, the guys have been at the forefront of using computers to support education, to support the lectures. And, and already back in 1992, um, we, we had like 50 workstations for, for some okay. 200 wow. students, which, which was crazy back yeah. then. It was really expensive. Mm -hmm. and, and this started out from one machine they bought, I guess, 15 years prior to that. Mm -hmm. um, and that first machine... Uh, was being taken care of by one of the students. So that became a tradition. And, and when I joined that school, I was asked by my math teacher if I would like to join the team and be one of the two guys mm. uh, that look out for these machines and make sure they run and, and work properly. Um, so at, this was probably, how old was I then? 15? Actually was put in charge of all the machines at school which meant I, I haven't been going to school anymore, <laughs> but it was just working on these things and uh, setting up uh, the first web servers and mail huh. servers and making sure the network would run. Um, yeah, I've pretty much spent all my time with these stuff. Right. And that sort of um, kicked off your interest in that whole uh, world and that whole line of work. And um, then afterwards, so you then moved to Zurich to, to go to ETH, right? Um, yeah, with, with, with doing that, it was pretty clear for me that I would go to ETH and study yeah. computer science. Uh, didn't move though. Okay. I, I stayed in Winterthur. Mm. Um, 
it's it's very uh, affordable. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and I liked it. I mean, I've been living there for some years, so mm. you make your friends, and, and it's absolutely doable to, to do it by train. So I, I stayed in Winterthur, went to ETH uh, to study computer science. Mm. Yeah. And um, so your startup, your company, focuses on plants and gardening yeah. and things like that. So. Oh. Did you have a green thumb as a kid? Did not you, at all. No. Did you have some plants all. in your? I mean, the, the the good plants in your in your room. Yeah. <laughs> I did. Did I have? Are there bad plants? <laughs> <laughs> some people um, are laughing. So. Um, uh, well, no. So how did how did uh, computer science and gardening interact intersect? How did that? Uh, so maybe first tell us a little bit what uh, what Kobachi does and. Um, yeah. What is, the, what is the concept, what is the product, and then you can tell us a little bit how the idea came about. What we did with Kobachi was to create a plant care assistant that would help people take care of their plant, because mm. you don't have a green thumb, and you don't know how to do it. So, so we figured that there is actually quite a lot of people that want to do green stuff, they want to do and even the bad stuff, but <laughs> also the other things. Um, people do have... Um, there is joy with plants, and it gives you something to fill the room, and we see there's plants here as well. So people want to do that, but they don't know how to do so. It's a frustrating experience. Right. You buy it, you kill it, you don't do it again. Um, so what we did is create an assistant that would help you be successful with that. Um, basically, it, it was an app that would send you a push notification at the perfect time. Uh, hey, now you need to water this plant. Now you need to uh, fertigate that one. And by the way, this is the kind of fertilizer to use, and this is how you should apply it. Um, that, that started off as a, a free app, uh, and we've just tried to grow the user base. Um, and then monetizing on that with the additional hardware, which was a, a sensor, a plant sensor that we created and built, that would measure then soil moisture and light intensity and temperature. Uh, use Wi-Fi to mm -hmm. transmit that to our cloud services, where we would then do an analysis based on the exact plant species to come, come up with uh, the, the advice that would be right. even more accurate. And so since you were not doing any gardening yourself, it wasn't yeah. the typical scenario of trying to solve a problem that you had. Yeah, it was actually. <laughs> okay, so it was. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I, I always wanted to create stuff. I didn't, I love to learn new things at ETH, but I didn't like that we, we've been doing just some prototyping, and maybe you would write a paper, and it will it would all end up in the bin uh, pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, if you're lucky, there were maybe two people looking at, at your work and, and giving you a grade, and that was it. And, and I didn't like that. So uh, for me, it was pretty clear that I would, um, after that, actually go and, and do something, like create something. Um, run into Professor Motel at ETH, who has been um, building out and, and running the group called uh, Ubiquitous Computing, prior to uh, everybody calling it the Internet of Things. Um, and he gave me a great opportunity. I said, mm. look, uh, just come join my group. We have plenty of money. And they did. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Um, and we were just allowed to do whatever. Yeah. Um, so I did that and uh, got my own office at ETH, uh, which was a boring and great place. So I wanted to be nice, knowing that I would spend a lot of time there. Um, and went and bought a plant, which is cumbersome because you don't know what to buy. It's it's probably too big for your standard car, so you have to rent a bigger car. Uh, it's expensive, as it turns out. You pay quite a lot of money with the pot and everything. So once it was in the office, I tried to make sure not to kill it. Now, how would, how would I do that? I, I didn't know. I, I had no idea. And that's how I came up with the idea of creating an assistant. Like, why wouldn't this thing just tell me what it needs? Mm. Like how hard can and I is be? that where the your focus or your interest on on the Internet of Things in general came about? Yeah. yeah. So from your perspective, what is how does the Internet of Things um, compare to when you first became interested in what, how you see it today? What is your description of the Internet of Things? For me, the Internet of Things is ultimately <coughs> IP moving to everyday things, objects. And these objects becoming cheaper and cheaper and smaller and smaller over time. Um, like, if we talk internet, we talk IP, and we we talk growing out this network that will allow stuff to connect, which means 
ultimately there will be a convergence of the physical and the digital mm -hmm. because every physical object does have a representation in the digital space. And comparing this, the, what we have today, if we talk about IoT to what we've done 12 years ago, um, was it, it was still a lot of research. Um, if, if you look at Moore's law, sorry guys for being very boring <laughs> here. Um, Moore's law stating that every 18 months, uh, stuff will just double, like mm. be it uh, speed of the, of the processor, density, whatever, it will just, it will double, which means right. it's, it's an exponential thing. And this happened already. So 2006, we, we knew it happened for the past 30 years and it will happen for the next 15 years. So how's the world gonna look like 10 years from now, mm. 10, 20 years from now? And that was the basic hypothesis we've been using in, in, the, in research. Um, but it was really a hypothesis. That, like building Internet of Things was was impossible back then. Uh, the stuff was still very big. Uh, you, you, the sensors or yeah. connectivity was was complicated to do. Was very very expensive to do. It, it worked on a research grade, but it it was it was not feasible to put this into a a product. And how did you go from the research from the the prototyping to an actual spin off? The whole concept, uh, we've done some pretty different projects. This, this Kubachi thing, um, that was just one of the small things that we did, but it, 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 it caught everyone's attention and we got a lot of good feedback. Mm. Um, so I decided to go for focus it. Focus on and that. Focus on it, um, uh, start a company and, and do it without knowing what that would mean. We had, we had no idea on how to actually do it. Um, you said you're a co-founder, so what, yeah. was, what was, when you just actually decided to spin it off to start your company, who was that? Or what, what was the team? Yeah, it, it was one of my colleagues, actually, mm -hmm. just the guy who happened to sit in the same office at ETH. Like, you're bored, I'm bored, let's do something. Exactly, <laughs> let's do something cool here. Uh, so that's how it all started. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've then built out a system, which meant that the software part was really easy. I mm -hmm. mean, for us, it was we, we knew how to do it, right. at least for like the first stage, and then uh, starting to tackle the hardware part, which then turned out <laughs> was really compl complicated um, because there was no standards for connectivity. Hmm. And and even in between 2006 to 2009, when we when we started Kubachi as a company, already a lot had happened in connectivity. Yeah. Um, so it became feasible. It was still rather big. It was still rather expensive, but mm -hmm. it, it could be done. So we did it. And when you were starting to work more on the hardware side, um, I imagine that was a big, what well, you just said is a more challenging than the software. Yeah. But what was the biggest challenge when you were thinking about a, an actual product that you could offer to, to the masses, to the consumer? Uh, well, us being software engineers, <clears throat> obviously the problem was figuring out what building hardware means. We had, we had no idea. Um, but, but uh, I mean, and, and building hardware, obviously you need to design the thing and you need to uh, figure out what, what goes into it and what the electronic components are and you need a manufacturer who, who builds that for you. That, that's kind of obvious. You can go through that. If you do it for the first time, it just takes more mm. time. It's a learning curve. Yeah. I think the biggest challenge was, was actually still in, in the connectivity part. Building a sensor that would connect to the internet um, still be battery powered and that for an affordable price, how would we do that? Hmm. that? That was the most challenging uh, thing to overcome. Yeah. Okay. And was there at a certain stage where after some time of trying to figure it out that, um, that you, you started to doubt whether it was the right decision or if it was the right path or the right direction? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, direction-wise, I think we, we've, we've gone for a rather careful Swiss approach, right. which meant we've probably taken longer than, than what was needed or that what would have been possible. Um, also spent more money, uh, for example, uh, manufacturing. Um, yes, we knew that there, it was labor-intensive, so it couldn't be done in Switzerland. Um, but 
we didn't go to the Chinese and say, uh, look, can you build that for us? Right. Being cautious, we went to a Swiss company that would actually help us with the engineering, uh, that, that these guys would also have facilities overseas, and we could manufacture with them, which meant it was more expensive, it did take more time, but it, it kind of worked out. Okay. Uh, and are you, are you still improving the plant sensor, or have you moved on to something bigger? Well, we, we have moved on, right? <laughs> um, I, was, I was using the past tense for, for the Kubachi thing, because the mm -hmm. Kubachi as a company doesn't exist anymore. Um, we, we, we have sold the company to Husqvarna Group back in 2015. Okay. Uh, not, not yet three years ago. And, ever, well, ever since, we have been using our know-how and our technology for the software part, for the connectivity part, to build Gardena hardware, mm -hmm. which is what me and the team now do. We, we right. build uh, these things. And this has now become a much bigger ecosystem, obviously. So it's not just a sensor, but it's, it's a water controller as well that automatically can actually turn on and off the water. Mm -hmm. It's robotic lawn mowers, it's, it's pumps, it's irrigation controls. It's, it's, it's quite a lot of devices and the software also doing then other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, as we now have many devices and the smartness doesn't lie just within the software, knowing the plants and making sense of what's going on, but also trying to figure out what is the best pattern of application for the different devices, like w which of these devices needs to do what uh, at what point in time and when during the day to get the perfect result. And how did the, the uh, the sale of the company come about? Did you were you looking for so when you started the company? Yeah. Uh, so let's back up a little bit before yeah. we talk about that. Did you have investments? Yes, we did. Um, and uh, you needed to get investments to uh, start developing, I guess, the hardware side of things. Uh, the hardware was the expensive yeah. part. Like, so how did you go about for looking for for investments? Is that something you did or your co-founder did? Yeah, that's I, I did that. Um, Yet well, another thing you had to figure out. Exactly. <laughs> Where do we get the money? Um, Were well, you bootstrapping it initially, or was uh, from the, from the ETH side? From ETH, and then using some funds that were um, tied to our occupation, uh, our our projects, and and what we've done mm -hmm. um, at ETH. So that was kind of the bootstrap uh, for the bootstrap, uh, even before the company. Which side note, that meant we had to negotiate IP with ETH. Okay. <laughs> um, and then going from that, we, we kind of had a rough idea on, on what we needed in terms of money. Mm -hmm. And because it was hardware, we needed, I would say, more than, yeah. than, than usual. So we, we were talking uh, six digits here. And we didn't know how to do that, but we just created the pitch deck and went to whatever he went mm -hmm. and tried to call whomever and, and get in touch with every potential investor until we figured out how to do it. And, and with whom to do it. And we've been lucky, as we found investors actually quite, quite locally. It was, okay. it was companies, okay. foundations, um, business angels uh, in, in Zurich and greater Zurich area in the end. Yeah. What would be your advice to someone looking for funding now? What's something key that you maybe did wrong a few times and figured out what was a, a, a good tip or a, yeah. good, a good suggestion? Um, my best advice probably is also a very hard advice um, because what, what I've learned is that you as the startup company looking for funding, I mean, you, you go to a lot of potential investors and you try to win them over and, and have them invest in your company. And then these guys will, will do a due diligence. They will figure out who you are, you, what's the market, what's the product, and they will, they will spend time looking at you. Yeah. And you should do the same thing. Mm. You, you should actually figure out who is that? Why is he investing? Um, what do I get? Like, is it just money? Is it smart money? Do I get the connections as well? Uh, is there a good personal fit? Like, uh, can you imagine working with these guys? Mm -hmm. Because if you can't, it's, it will be difficult. Yeah. Most probably, uh, you're looking for X, and most probably X is not going to do. So you'll have to have a discussion with the guys. Look, we need a little more, <laughs> just a little, just now. 
Can you help us out? And, and uh, you will have, you're going to have difficult uh, discussions. Mm. So you need to figure out, is there a good fit as well? You do your own due diligence right. when it comes to, to the investor selection. Okay. Um, I mean, ideally, y you have more people wanting to invest in your company than you actually need. And you can be picky about who is going to invest as well. And the second one is probably a rather easy one. Uh, if you do it for the first time, uh, there is a learning curve as well. So start out with a long list of, of potential investors, rank them according to what you think is the top priority. This would be your perfect investor. And then start at the bottom and work your way up. Um, because you're going to hear no. And then just go back and ask why. Why aren't you investing? Go back, refine your pitch deck, mm. refine your business case, yeah. um, and you will get better and better at pitching. And, and uh, when you're at the top of the list, you you will be very good, mm. which will increase chances. Obviously, sure. yeah. yeah, that's a good that's a good point. So then, at some point in time, there was a, an interest an acquisition. Yeah. Did you go looking for uh, for that? So, as soon as you take on any yeah. investor's money, you have to think about some form of exit, yeah. some way of, of returning the mm -hmm. investment to mm -hmm. your investors. So did you already have an exit strategy from that stage, or was that something that developed later on? Did they come to you? Were you looking for them? Um, it developed later on. Um, I, I probably now advise to have an exit strategy, even in early stages. It can, can be very simple, just to have a course idea of where you want to go with the company. Right. Um, our answer was always, we don't want to sell. Um, IPO, who knows? Let's just, our goal is to make this a working and sound business, right. uh, which is OK, but it's, it's not, it's not what, what ultimately is going to, hear, to happen. Right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so so we, we have then started to have an exit strategy just for the sake of having one. Um, going into strategic opportunities and looking at what is possible came from the business end, actually, because after some two years of selling the hardware, we've realized where our weaknesses are. Mm. Um, we did have a product that was totally unknown. Um, our product was a plant sensor. Nobody's ever heard of a right. plant sensor. Um, if, if we would talk to someone uh, for two minutes or maybe three minutes, they would get why this is a good thing and why they would want one, mm -hmm. but two minutes is, is a long time. So it was a totally new product category. Uh, the product was quite expensive and the, the brand was totally unknown. Right. Um, Kobachi, what, what the hell is that? Sounds Japanese. Um, and that meant we did actually do okay when it came to online sales using uh, con consumer electronics channels. That, that worked out, but the majority of our potential customer base we're still looking at, at gardening and plant mm. stuff. And we didn't find our way into these guys. We didn't find our way into, into stationary retail. Um, we knew it was possible, but we, it would have, again, taken quite a lot of time and quite a lot of money. So we have been looking for strategic partners that would have brand and distribution. Right, OK. Uh, and that's how we came to talk to Gardena, for example, and, and similar companies rather early on. Mm. Um, and then it took. So not in two or three years. It came <laughs> mainly from your side, from a strategic partnership perspective, but then the conversation evolved yes. to be to make more sense as an acquisition. Yeah. yeah. And what was the biggest challenge in the acquisition? So in this case, it was an acqui hire or, or yeah. an acquisition. Yeah, so yeah. you left your startup and joined a corporate. Yeah, exactly. Um, was it was the the biggest challenge from your perspective a cultural fit, or was it the actual process, the the legal side, or um, well, or prior all, to all the, of the above, <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> um, uh, prior to closing, um, obviously the challenge was we, we were to be acquired by a huge enterprise. Um, that meant they had legal and uh, business people by the many uh, that would go about our company and do an in-depth due, due diligence. Mm. And for us, it was a team of two or three that, that was capable of, of answering the questions these guys had. So, so that, it became that a full-time job? It became a full-time job for, for about one and a half months. Just just this, this whole due diligence, which was a first for us, and we didn't know how to do that. And, yeah. and where you could probably 
trip uh, and, and go the wrong way because mm. you're talking to legal and the business guys, they, they understand the rationale why you were buying the company, but the legal guys might have a say in valuation as well. So you, you, you want to get it absolutely right. That was just very stressful. Um, and then post to that, I think we have been very lucky um, because it took us from, from first conversations with that particular company, and obviously we've been talking to many, uh, first conversations to the actual closing, it took us almost four years. Hmm. So in, in, in that four years time, we had plenty of time to get to know the company that we were okay. selling to. Yeah. And the business end uh, knew us already as well. So when we actually went for it, we had a very clear vision on what to do with this. Um, setting it up as a new R&D division, as a new business division. We would, uh, the, the company is in Ulm and in Stockholm, but we would keep the team here in Zurich. We would allow this team to work in very different ways, um, try to keep this startup culture that we have, okay. not, not trying to interfere. Right. Uh, we had a very clear agreement that they would not put the whole process thing that comes with the big enterprise on top of that. Mm. Uh, and with that background, uh, it was actually, it, it was c quite pleasant then. Mm. Um, of course, for me, um, that wasn't the case. I mean, we, we had to figure out how, how it works and to whom you have to talk to to get things going. But yeah. um, the, it was it was On it the day-to-day -day side of things, it was yeah. pretty much business as usual. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if someone has a question, uh, just raise your hand. We have one question already. How would you uh, characterize your, your customers? Is it more of an urban product or a rural product, if you look at, say, a European market? The, the product we're selling right now? The Kubashi um, product. Uh, the Kubashi was built with a focus on indoor applications. Right. So it was an urban thing. Um, and, and that was our customer base in the first place. Um, I would say urban 25 to 45 maybe, you have to, have, you have to be quite tech savvy. Uh, it certainly had this gadget uh, thing to it, and the sensor was 100 bucks, so it was quite expensive. You needed to have some, it, wasn't, it was not just about the plants, it, it was more about the gadget in the first. Our early adopters, these guys were into the gadget in the first place, and mostly guys, not, not just, there were some girls as well, but mostly guys. We actually had, <laughs> we had a few customers that would buy the sensor and then write us an email, hey, now I have this cool plant sensor, but I don't have a plant, what should I buy? Uh, so that, that was cool. Yeah. And w was that part of your evaluation of your market? Did you know that you would target this kind of uh, um, customers before you could say and look into um, what you valued as a market? Um, we had kind of a rough idea but uh, we, we, we didn't do market research, um, I would say not, not proper enough. Um, did we know our customer? Not, not really. I mean, we, we did have some early adopters, we did have some conversations, and then we tried to go with some design thinking approaches when it came to the actually creating the product, but that was on a, on a very, very small scale. Um, for us, it was more about then learning while doing it. Uh, we started, <coughs> excuse me, we started the app one and a half years before launching the sensor. And, and when we started, yeah, but there wasn't much there. Um, there was a very small plant library and there was very small advice part, but there was a very big feedback button. And, and that turned out to be very, very valuable. Mm. And we, we have gotten, I, I was surprised on the amount and the quality of feedback we got. And that helped us greatly in, in creating the product. If you could do it again, would you do it differently? Yeah, certainly. <laughs> um, I think one very difficult question is about the hardware. Um, because doing hardware, if it comes to consumer, is, is, is very difficult. And you have to be really sure that you, you, you hit the right sweet spot when it comes to feature set and when it comes to price point. Which for a startup, because you do have limited amounts of or limited resources mm -hmm. when it comes to doing market research is a difficult thing. And if you get it wrong, it takes a lot of time to change it. Um, so I'd probably have started with the hardware part much later on or, or try to not do hardware at all, but get someone else to do the hardware. Um, and then in, in the setup of, of uh, the whole thing, um, it's actually about knowing the customer and knowing where to grow. We, we figured 
okay, that's our customer base, but we totally forgot about peripheral users that actually have a pain point mm. and that are willing to pay much more money. And maybe we should have started with these guys and right. then grow out to the majority and not try to capture the majority in the first place. And what advice would you have for new founders today? What's, you know, to take your idea and turn it into a business idea or yeah. a success? What, what's your key advice or what would you be your, your biggest um, tip? Know for your customer. Know your customer, like to the, to the very detail that is, is at all possible because only if you know your customer, you, you can figure out how to create the product. And it's not just about the feature set, it's about your, your messaging, it's about your storytelling, it's about pi price point and, and how, you can then, uh, how can you then evolve that. Right. And, and if you know that, it's, it's execution, which is not easy, um, but there is, I don't know, hundreds of tips and probably just have, have to be persistent and, and do it. And, mm. If you are persistent and if you are passionate about what you do, you, you can overcome these things. But always think about the customer because ultimately that's where you get the money from. Right. This is more for private gardening stuff. What it's about farmers. There's a lot of plants growing out there. Mm -hmm. They need water also. Mm -hmm. So is there plants going in this direction for the industry? So for, for, for our big enterprise that, that I'm now employed, uh, yes, uh, yes, there is. Um, but again, it's it's about knowing the customer and 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 customer segmentation. So, uh, what what we do with my team uh, is is for the Gardena brand. And the Gardena brand has a very clear positioning on this is for the passionate gardener. This is for everybody. Like this is for you and me. It's not professional use. It's residential. Um, for the professional use, which is then much complicated, much more complicated to grasp. Um, we do have different brands in, in our group, and these guys then create products uh, using same technology, actually. So uh, we, we started with, with the Gardena products um, using our technology, which is now growing out to become a backend that we use for other applications as well. But these guys, we do approach with a different brand on a different channel. Yeah. Um. I have a question. Uh, can you imagine to uh, apply your technology on more than one plant, let's say like hundreds or thousands of indoor plants? Not in a treehouse, but maybe uh, in office spaces or, or something like this? Yeah, absolutely. Like, technologi yeah. like regarding the technology, the technology would, it be, would it be possible? What is your opinion? Yeah, yeah it would be possible. Um, I think there's two sides to it. One was, or one is, um, the, the clever stuff, I mean, the secret sauce uh, of this is we do get the sensor data of what's going on in your plant, in your garden, in your flower bed, um, and, and we aggregate this with, with the weather forecasts we get, with the history of what you have been doing, and then we have a plant library for every plant species knowing exactly what this kind of plant needs, given season, given location, and whatnot. And, and the algorithms that we, we created there are optimized to have your plant grow and not die. I mean, that, that's, that's, our, that's the goal of our algorithms, which is totally different if you compare that to an agricultural use, for example, where you just try to minimize input and maximize yield. So if, if you want to do that, you have to use different, different logic, different algorithms. Um, when it comes to taking care of hundreds of plants or thousands of plants in an office building, these algorithms would work. And we've looked into that, but then again, you have a totally different product, you have a totally different customer, you have a totally different go-to-market. The customer then wouldn't be uh, the guy sitting next to the plant because he, he, he's not in charge of the plant. Actually, the plant doesn't even belong to the company, it doesn't belong to the bank where he's employed. There is a company leasing out the plants and servicing the plant, so you'd have to figure out how is this market then structured, which works differently in Germany and in Switzerland. And, and that became complex. So growing out into these spaces meant for us it wouldn't scale at the rate that we have been looking for, which meant we've put that to the side, for, for the, at least for the startup part, yeah. we put that to the side. And um, would every plant need a sensor for this? Or, or would it, uh, yeah, would every plant need a sensor? 
Um, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, ideally, yes. But obviously, if you have a flower bed or if you have a bigger pot with, with similar plants or exactly the same plants, one sensor uh, does, does perfectly. Yeah. So no, you don't need a sensor for every plant. Um, but you could. Cool. Thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, you said you sold the company three years ago, mm -hmm. but you're still working for the company, or like, and how far are you still involved in the company? I mean, it, it was it was a, a talent acquisition as well. So we, the company, our company, was acquired because of technology we had, because of IP we had, and because of the talent. Um, so. Um, the company acquiring us, they made sure that they would lock in uh, my key guys and, and me as well. So for the first two years, we didn't really have a choice, which was a good thing, by the way. Um, because f for us, w we wanted to make this big, right? That, that was our intention. Um, we didn't sell for the money per se. We, we wanted to see this actually grow to a maturity, which we have now been able because we were given the tools, given distribution and brand. And that was amazing to see. Like, we have been struggling to sell a few thousand sensors in there. And just put Gardena on it, um, give it to the sales organization, <laughs> which is a few hundred guys, and bam, you make 100 times the same <laughs> revenue just putting it into the channel. So uh, doing that was, was, was actually very cool for, for all of us. And um, I'm still there because it's still something that we can grow out, and me and the team have been given the task to not just create these new products, but to digitize the product offering of the company, which is a very cool task to have. I'm very proud also that, that everybody who was with me at the time of acquisition is, is still working for, mm. for that company, yeah. So basically it was not an exit, more kind of a licensing your patents and technology or? Well, it became an exit. Um, so it's an acquisition, which, yeah. is a, which is a form of exit. Uh, or another term is an acquihire. So you're acquiring and hiring at the same time, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, so you still own shares of your own company? No, I don't. It's just like a partial? No, I don't. No, full no. exit? Yeah, it was a full exit, um, which would not have been necessary per se. But the way we have structured the future for the joint future, this was the only concept that made sense. Um, the, the first idea, the first notion we had for a joint venture was that we would actually be licensing mm. some of the tech, um, help them create their own products, let them do the hardware, us do the software, and replicate that in other markets um, where Gardena is not, not operating. Um, but these being German guys, maybe, I don't know, would, would a Swiss company do it differently? Maybe, nah, probably. Um, Gardena is the leader in, in the European market, and they try to stay at the number one position. So for, they were quite adamant of doing this exclusively, mm -hmm. even worldwide, because who knows? Maybe we want to conquer the US uh, next year. So once they were set on exclusively owning our secret sauce, that meant we didn't really have an opportunity for other business. So the only, the only way the strategic partnership did make sense what was an acquisition. So was your decision to still stay at the company or was this like a term of the contract that you have to stay for another couple of years or? Well, it was, you, it you was said our, the, first, it, the first two exactly. years was required. And the first that, two years was acquired. Now it's your choice. Exactly. And uh, so you're staying because you enjoy it. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we have a few more questions, but on the topic you're talking about, your team is still with you. Um, a, a big challenge that startups you, uh, will face as they start to grow is hiring people. Yep. Of course, it's easy when at the beginning when it's people you know, um, people you work with, or your your partner at, uh, at ETH. Mm -hmm. But then when you have to put out an ad and an, get a complete stranger to join your intimate, close yeah. team, then it becomes a bit more challenging. And then when you go from five to 10 to yeah. 20, how do you keep the culture? So yeah. what, what was your experience with uh, needing to start hiring people? Yeah, um, exactly as you said. Um, once you go from 10 to 20 and from 20 to 30, um, 
you need to institutionalize the culture, mm -hmm. which which previously just happened. Right. Um, there, there's a few people, and the way they act, the way they approach a problem, and and when and how they solve it basically defines the culture of the company. Um, but once you start to grow out, and and we have been hiring like crazy, still are. It's it's. Uh, if you if if the guys ask me how many people are now working at the Zurich office, I'm so. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to check back. Probably another one started, um, and and that that was more complicated, which meant we had to spend much more time in hiring. Uh, one one example uh, of what we do here, which which is successful, is the hiring decision is a team decision. Mm -hmm. So it's not a R and D manager uh, going to the interview and saying, "Okay, you are now hired," but if if a software developer, for example, is is applying for a job. He's being grilled for six hours by everybody in the team, and in the end, it's a team decision. Is this guy capable, and is, is he a fit for us, for right. the team? Um, and, and then, from a management point of view, there's, there's just more you need to do, and you need to actually, as I said, institutionalize, because it doesn't happen. You have mm. to do more of like retreat stuff and, and make sure you have some, you have some team building stuff, right. because it doesn't not just happen naturally. Right. So a lot more effort goes into yeah. keeping the culture and the inspiration and yeah. the, the energy yeah. levels high. We're making sure you say you share the same values. Yeah. Um, you have to establish and be very, very much more clear about the values mm. and, and, and why these are the right values. Uh, and specifically, when hiring some th someone, what's what's something that you look for? Or so you know, again, you know, people will be looking to expand yeah. their team. And um, is there something? unique that you something that you uh, like your trademark that you look for um no i wouldn't say it's trademark i mean Not trademark but your, your personal yeah, something that that's talent just, talent is is most important yeah um we're, we're working in in obviously agile methods uh, being applied um but growing that out uh, as, as i said an mm -hmm. example being the team is responsible for the hiring decision. Right. And the team is responsible for quite a lot of stuff. And that means you, you need to have uh, a certain culture within that team and mm. you, need to, you need to have capable people um, for that to work. Um, so talent certainly is very, very important. And then it's the attitude of getting things done. Uh, I think that is, that is something that has always been very important right. for us. Obviously, that changed slightly from the early days where Simply, there was no other option of getting it done. <laughs> it was a question of survival right. almost every day, uh, and now you have to kind of um, a personal initiative. bring this in. Like, yeah. why? I mean, the company is doing record year after the record year, and it doesn't really matter if I come into work. Yes, it does matter. It does matter whether you actually do a good job mm -hmm. or not. And and if we if we are successful in conveying that, um, then we also attract the right talent for right. people that that want to get things done. Of course. Yeah. So we had some questions on that side of the room. And right I, here. It's coming, it's coming. Getting back to the culture, um, how do you make sure that the startup culture you had in place before now also um, keeps on being lived now that you're in a big company? Mm -hmm. well, I think one thing that helped us tremendously was we, we kept the team that was required to develop this product co-located. So and at one office, we have from embedded development, backend, frontend, UX, UI, the plant physiologist, everybody sitting in the same room. And more importantly, these guys sitting far away from everybody else in the company, right? They're, they're here in Zurich, and the rest of the non-agile, non startup thing is happening in Germany, uh, and that's that's far away. Uh, even in the day of digital, a video conference is not the same, and you, t you tend not to do it, uh, and they communicate over the Slack, which is not the same. So they are actually relying on each other in that one room, and that, that helped tremendously. And then the other thing is for me to, to be kind of the the big scrum master and, and shield these guys from the bad influences that eventually start to trickle in from the big enterprise. Which is just, it's just a lot of work. Um, convincing the big enterprise on why this is good and why we should just keep it as the way it is. 
but you're managing this, this interface. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Colin, and my question would be, it's kind of leaning on to your answer that he had before, but so with Kubashi, you had the first round where you got all your investors in. And after you got your investors in, let's say you would like to have Google to buy you up because you would fit into Google Home perfectly. I mean, yeah. you could manage everything through that. And how would you get noticed by them? Would you just be so good they can't ignore you? Or would you pitch to them like normal investors? I mean, it's a theoretical question, but maybe... Do all of that. the above. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Do whatever you can. I mean, use the personal connections you have. If you don't have them, build them. Go to the events. Get to know the people. Write to them. Uh, be it LinkedIn or, or email or whatever you can do to get to the right people. Ultimately, with the big company, you have to find that one guy, or maybe it's two, that understand what you're doing and why this is a good thing and why this is interesting for Google or for whatever big company you're. you're. And that's, that's the challenging part, figuring out who that is, that, that owns and is your evangelist within the company. So how did you find that out when you had that transition before your exit? I've just been going to Ulm very regularly from 2010, 11, 12, 13. That's where the headquarters are. Yeah, I just made sure that I had meetings with the CTO and then with the guy responsible for watering and this guy changed and someone else came in so I made sure I have a meeting with him and presenting the vision of how the garden would look like in the future until eventually I found someone who got it. Yeah. Perfect, thanks. I have a question uh, related to digital marketing. What would be your advice for those who want to build brand, present, uh, brand presence online for a product that is a co in a completely new category? You mentioned at some point mm -hmm. that there was a moment when the product was successful online. Yeah. What um, was working then? What made it happen? My advice, uh, if you're not an expert, Go get yourself an expert, and I'm not one of them. Uh, so that's what we did. We started as two tech guys, mm -hmm. and, and we didn't know how to do that. So pretty early on, uh, we brought someone into the core team when we built this out who would know how to do that. Um, and this guy would come up with the marketing plan, the marketing spend, and the initiatives and campaigns, and the messaging, and, and, and where to do it. And, um, then we just try different things. Now, I think that's the beauty of, of digital is you can try um, and you get quite detailed statistics from be it Google or Facebook or whatever platform you're then uh, using on what's working and what not. And, and you can rework the, the messaging, you can rework the, the storytelling and try something different. Testing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So thanks for the talk. And um, from one hardware company to a different uh, guy of a hardware company, um, what was your, like you said, oh, you had these difficulties of, of selling a thousand products or in the thousands of products mm. in the beginning and yeah. now everything has scaled to a yeah. very different yeah. um, scenario. Um, how, how did you manage to kind of work over this kind of low volume scaling until you hit the thresholds from which, I mean, for perhaps for people who don't know about hardware, hardware is very expensive if you're at low volumes because every part costs you a lot more. Yeah. And once you hit like 50,000, 100,000 units, your costs will drop nearly to a third or something. So it's, it's simply a matter of if you're big, you can get the stuff cheap. And if you're small, you have to pay so much for it. Mm -hmm. Like how, how did you, or what was your approach to, to that? To have a pricing or to have a product offering that would work even with only manufacturing a few thousand, a few ten thousand. If, if you can't get that, if, if you require a hundred thousand for the price point to make sense, you, you're, you're at a very risky path because it might happen and it might not. Um, and then the other thing is uh, we in the end found a very good partner uh, helping us with the final engineering, industrialization and manufacturing where, where we had a pretty cool deal where they would actually help us, they, they, they kind of became an investor uh, and they funded the first stage of that and they would help us with the first batch of hardware um, for us to get any traction. And once we got that, for, for them it was much easier to see, okay, it's, it's, not, it's not a stupid idea, they've, they've sold a few thousand sensors. 
And from that on, we at least had a working relationship, um, which I think is, is more important in the first two stages, to have a working relationship where you have a manufacturer that you can call and say, look, we need another 10,000, can you please build them? And they do that. They don't ask for bank guarantees and before doing that. Yeah. Yeah, on that topic, I know you decided, like you said earlier, you decided not to go to China for your hardware, yeah. but someone else I was talking to, another founder in a hardware yeah. space, did go to China. He's planning to be there for two weeks, ended up moving there for three or six months, something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. But that personal relationship enabled them to get, normally a, a prototype would take six, there was a six month waiting list. Oh. He happened to bump into the guy at a cafeteria and he got it done in, in two weeks instead. Yeah, exactly. So oh. it, it is about those personal connections, especially at such an early stage that, yeah. that can make you know, life and death to your company. Uh, difference. Absolutely, and if you are manufacturing over there, um, I mean, you probably have a different notion of, of quality. <clears throat> so you need to make sure you get what you're looking for, um, which means you have to be on the ground. Um, uh, I had one of my guys uh, in Malaysia, we've manufactured in Malaysia. Uh, he, was, he was in Malaysia for eight months, just setting it up and making sure we get the right quality. Yeah. So what's, what's a mistake that you would like other, on other entrepreneurs to avoid? Build the wrong product, <laughs> because that, that's what we did. Um, we've built a product that was, to my taste at least, was very beautiful. It was an iconic design. The app was very cool. Um, the sensor was very accurate. Uh, there was a Wi-Fi connection that would last on two AA batteries for over one year. It was crazy back in 2010, but we made it work, um, which meant in the end we have to ask for 99 Swiss francs slash dollars, whatever, still not getting the margin that we actually would have needed mm. um, because we have created a product that was very good, but it was too good and it was too expensive because we did not go to the customer in the first place and figure out, hey, right. what, what would you actually pay? We built the product that we wanted to build, um, make sure we get all the features ticked that they have been asking for, but forgot about the price. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We have time for maybe one, one more question. Here we go. So how is uh, prototyping with hardware? How is it developing? How is, how is, is it getting better? Is it, is it uh, easier to do rapid prototyping and can you put it in the hands of users? Yeah. I mean, nowadays, absolutely, even on the electronics part, you, you can, you, with FGPAs and, and stuff, you, you can prototype really complex things really, really easy, really fast. And if you're talking about design and haptics, you have 3D printing and you can, you can easily iterate in the development phase, um, which now we're also doing. Um, and, and again, you, sh you should be doing that. Um, with the electronics, I think there is a point where you have to stop doing it and just have a decision. It's mostly price-driven decision. We don't care about this component. This is, this is the cost of goods that we allow ourselves at max. So that's what we have. Uh, and let's optimize cost and, and performance on, 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 on that. Um, and with the design, I think, again, it comes down to know your customer. How relevant is it? Um, and there is totally different uh, approaches to I don't care ab about it at all to it needs to be pitch perfect Apple world style yeah and uh, is it then easier if you have like the hardware as a platform and then do a lot of functionality in the software or is that uh, what, what's the balance there uh, no n not really I mean if we're if we're working on new concepts we try to have hardware prototypes as, as early as possible, um, but that is mainly to make sure we, we hit the right quality level. Uh, and iterations now is about getting the quality right. So that means a lot of testing early on. For the, for the software development or for the software teams, they, they can work with stops and they can work with fixtures and they can work with, okay, uh, we we'll just have a simulation and if everything works and there is a red light, let's assume that will mean water is turning on. That's, that's good enough. Um, but obviously, you, you can increase the level of motivation if you have the early prototypes lying around and have the team work with that already. Yeah. Which we do. 
<laughs> <laughs> so we like to wrap up our fireside chat with this series of rapid fire questions. So the idea, there's some very short, very quick questions and Ideally, the first thing that comes to mind is what we'd like to hear. Okay. So, what is one item that you own that you would never sell? Uh, do I own an item? My car. What is your most unusual skill? I can sing. <laughs> What's more? After some music. <laughs> What's more important, strength, speed, or stamina? Stamina. Which historical figure do you most admire? Or personality? Steve Jobs. What is your favorite season of the year? Spring. When was the last time that you tried something new? Probably yesterday. Team or single founder? Team. Cats or dogs? Cats. Beer or wine? Wine. What's your favorite app besides Kobachi? <laughs> uh, Flipboard. What's one thing on your bucket list? Um, drive a Formula One car. And if you could have the attributes of an animal, what would it be? Be cute. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a unique answer. <laughs> Philip, thank you so much for joining us You're tonight. You're most welcome. Thank it you was for a pleasure. everything that you shared with us. Thank you very great. much for having me. Thanks, David.